thank God for you and your faithfulness. Amen. We acknowledge the presence of God that's in this place, but also wherever you may be worshiping on Facebook Live or Zoom. We acknowledge our great leadership, our bishop, Bishop Samuel Lawrence Green Sr., and our supervisor, Supervisor Phyllis N. Green. Last night, we celebrated the greatest presiding elder team in all African Methodism, presiding elder Philip C. Anderson and his queenly wife, Sister Sandra A. Anderson. I'm surprised she's still on her feet, but to the hardest working and the best gift God ever gave me after Jesus, Sister Donna Black. <laughs> to Reverend Curry and our ministry team, to our Board of Stewards, Board of Trustees, Class Leader Council, musicians, students, ushers, ministry chairs, AV team, other officers, visitors, members, and friends. I gotta do a special shout out to the People's family. They're in everything, they helped in everything. And we thank God for sending them and adding them to the ministry team. We greet you in the joy and the love of the Lord. Join me now as we petition God for a word. Lord, we pause before you today seeking a word. A word that can change our lives for the rest of our lives. John Black doesn't have that word, but you do. Hide him behind your cross. Speak a word to him and speak a word through him that your people might be edified. Speak a word to him and speak a word through him so that someone will be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to look at the epistle of James. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 1, and we'll read the first eight verses. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who, generously, who, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Sermon title today, Tempted and Tried. Tempted and try. This is the last Sunday of the conference year. In the past, this Sunday was used by preachers to prepare their congregations for the possibility that the bishop might assign them to a different congregation on the following week. I, I grew up in St. Luke Amy Church in Sumter, South Carolina, and for the first 14 years of my life, the Reverend H.B. Andrews was my pastor. And each year, Reverend Andrews would take this last Sunday, they used to call it Conference Sunday, and he would preach the same sermon more or less each year. We called it his farewell sermon. It was a time that he made sure he got everything in place in case he didn't come back. There was no unfinished business. Well, you know, one year, he decided he wasn't going to preach the farewell sermon. And you know where this story is going. That was the year the bishop moved him. Now, I don't preach farewell sermons. I, I, 
I pastor with all my might until they move me. And so uh, I'm starting a sermon series on Conference Sunday. I know that sounds strange. I'm starting a sermon series on Conference Sunday. That doesn't mean I'm presumptuous, but it means that I'm going to work as if this will be before me next week. And if it isn't, I know where I'm going to be doing next week, preaching from this sermon series series, sermon. We're going to entitle this new sermon series, A Season with the Epistle of James. And, and I'm looking right now at James uh, Gatson. His favorite scriptures are found either in the Psalms or in the book of James. And when we had in-person prayer services, I could count on Brother James to read from James. So I, I'm listening to hear his amens as we go through this sermon series. James provides us with a practical approach to Christian living. Traditionally, the epistle of James has been attributed to James, the brother of Jesus. But the higher critical scholars, they're not quite sure who wrote the book. The epistle was written to Jewish believers. The epistle was written to Jewish believers. This is different from the arm of the church that received the epistles of Paul. The epistles of Paul were written to Gentiles coming out of pagan religions. James is writing to believers that grew up in Judaism. And they have come to embrace Jesus as the Messiah. Paul, on the other hand, is trying to protect his church from Judaizers. And so he is writing about grace and being free from the law. James has no reason to tell his congregation to be free from the law. James believed Jesus, and it could have been his brother Jesus, fulfilled the law. And that Jewish believers should live to fulfill the law. Wow, wow. Now, now, the average modern Christian has this fantasy that back in the first century, all the churches preached the same thing and looked the same way and acted the same way. And they had no pseudo denominations or denominations. But that's not true. E.R. Dodds, in his book, Pagans and Christians in the Age of Anxiety, he traces numerous churches, numerous denominations that came out of Pauline theology, just Paul. And, and, and many of them we would later call heresies, but they were all worshiping Christians in the early church. We seem to think something is so strange because one church preaches this and another church preaches that. That has been going on since the beginning of Christianity. Denominations aren't new. They're not new. There are many, many arms to the body of Christ from day one. And so we see now two very distinctive arms in the body of Christ. One being Pauline, free from the law, and one being James, which would say fulfillment of the law. Now, now, we can do what many modern Christians do and try to harmonize that, but there really isn't any need to do that. Both are seeing God from their vantage point. If you're sitting on the left side of this uh, sanctuary, my left, you see me differently than if you're sitting on my right. If you're sitting behind me, you see me differently than if you're seeing, sitting in front of me. Why should I tell the people on my left they got it wrong because they see this handsome side of my face? And the people behind me, they got it wrong because they see my beautiful bald spot. They're both looking at me. When the Jewish side of the church looked at Jesus, they saw the fulfillment of the law. When the Pauline arm of the church looked at Jesus, they saw freedom. 
from the law. Both were looking at Jesus. I know that's complex, but you know what? Scientists agrees with us that we can hold two contradictory thoughts and declare them both to be true. You ever heard of quantum physics? Quantum physics has two concepts that they declare to be true. One says the smallest aspects of the universe is made of a wave. And then the other says the smallest aspect of the universe is made of a particle. Now, it's not one group of quantum physics that believe one and another group. All quantum physicists believe both. How can it be both? So they do mathematical equations based on waves and mass mathematical equations based on particles. And they say both are true. Oh, I, did I lose you? For the next few weeks, we're going to explore James theology. Amen? Most of the time when we read our Bibles, we are reading Pauline theology. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. But the wise foreparents of, uh, we had saw fit to include some of this James theology in the equation. In our text, James is helping his congregation to understand the various attacks they are experiencing. James is one of the senior pastors in Jerusalem. The book of Acts sheds some light on the persecution, the trials, and the temptations this congregation James is writing to, they're facing. The first source of persecution came from a group of religious leaders called the Sanhedrin Council. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. I'm going to read this carefully because it's important to understand how I'm going to say church folks act. The high, then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Not theology, not with a word from God, not filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. That's how church folks work. So the first group of uh, people to persecute this congregation were their own, the Sadducees. This became a process that went from imprisonment to murder. Stevens was murdered in Acts chapter 7 and became the first martyr of the church. James, the brother of John, was killed by a sword in Acts chapter 12. All of this is involving that Jerusalem congregation. Acts 8, 1b helps us. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered abroad throughout Judea and Samaria. Eventually, the Christians will come and become the escape goat, not just for Judaism, but for the whole Roman Empire. Neo, Nero is going to burn Rome, and he's going to blame Christians. And the groups that he's blaming, including the people who received this epistle. Now, I'm saying that so we'll understand when we talk about being tempted and tried what we're talking about. We're not talking about someone spoke rudely to them. Yeah, that might have happened, but that's not what this epistle is about. We're not talking about someone that didn't speak to them when they walked in the church or actually had the audacity to turn their head the other way. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. We're not talking about someone started a rumor on them. No, no, no. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. Someone forgot their birthday or sent a naked birthday card, didn't have enough courtesy to put a little $10 bill. We're not talking about that as persecution. I, the reason I'm saying that because some folks think that's, that's not persecution. 
We're not talking about the fact that you didn't call when I was sick, even though I didn't tell you I was sick, you didn't call. We're not talking about that kind of persecution. We're not talking about you wore the same thing I wore to church. We're not talking about that kind of persecution. We're not talking about you sat in my pew on Easter Sunday morning and you know I always sit in that. We're not talking about that kind of persecution. Uh, we, we, we're not talking about the kind of persecution that many modern Christians think they're facing. That's not what this church is dealing with. They're dealing with being persecuted because they lifted high the name of Jesus. Are the mics on? Is, is AV working? <laughs> Amen. Amen. All the things I said hurt. It does hurt when someone you thought was your friend slights you. That does hurt when someone you thought was your friend spreads a rumor about you. It does hurt when you are you know, see the two-facedness of someone you used to respect. That does hurt. But that's not what James is writing about. When the church stops playing church and starts doing what it has been called to do, real persecution will break out against the church. We, we want to be comfortable and we want to be accepted and we want society to love us, but we represent a kingdom that is not of this world. We represent light to a world that lies in darkness. We represent salt to a world that is perishing. We represent God to a world that follows his adversary. And when we stand up and become the church that we're supposed to become, real persecution breaks out against us. I have a presentation that I've done and uh, last time I did it was in uh, Texas, and uh, they asked me to come out, and in that presentation, I used Dylan Roof's GPS record, and I show how he stalked Mother Emmanuel. I'm going to say something, too. If you haven't looked at his record, Dylan Roof knew more about black America than most black Americans know. He visited all our stuff, took notes. And that's how he knew who to target. It wasn't by accident. And, and what inspired Dylan Roof to become who he became was George Zimmerman. When George Zimmerman was found not guilty, Dylan Roof didn't like the backlash that came from the black community. And that got him to thinking. And he started to plot on what he would do. He settled on Clemente Pinckney as his target when Michael uh, Slager was, you remember what happened? He was not brought up on charges for murdering Walter Scott. And Clemente Pinckney spoke truth to power. Said, this, there's a video showing that this innocent man was murdered by a law enforcement officer. And that's when Dylan Roof decided that Clemente Pinckney would be his prime target. When we stand up for Christ, when we stand up for what is right, when we protect those who can't protect themselves, the enemy is angry. James is writing to those who had the courage to stand up for the name of Christ. And now they're facing persecution. And what does this pastor James have the audacity to do? He said, listen, count it all joy. He didn't say you're going to be happy. No, it's not happiness you feel. You can't 
feel happiness when they're going into your Bible studies and murdering nine of your fellow church mates. You don't feel happiness over that. But he said, count it all joy because something is coming on you that wouldn't be available had it not happened. What, what James is doing is what the young people call flipping the script. When you, when you fall into that kind of persecution, it allows you then to stop looking at those little small things in the world and to reset your vision to understand the bigger issues of the body of Christ. Well, why are we counting it joy? Because persecution will give us perseverance. Perseverance is the ability to accomplish life goals. Most of life goals won't come easy, and many of them will not be fulfilled in one lifetime. Perseverance allows us to do anything that's important in life. You can't get a decent education and a career if you don't know how to persevere. You, 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 you can't have a fulfilling marriage if you don't know how to persevere. You, you, you can't raise successful children if you don't know how to persevere. It takes a real high level of perseverance to be a member of the AME Church because you couldn't deal with AME politics if you didn't know how to persevere. Perseverance allows us to transform our nation from a nation of political parties to one nation under God. Perseverance allows us to make the crooked way straight and the rough way smooth. Perseverance is required because the moral arc of the universe is long. The moral arc of the universe is long. But if we persevere, we'll realize it will bend toward justice. It will bend toward righteousness. It will bend toward godliness if we persevere. James is encouraging the believers to change their worldview so that they see a benefit and being tempted and tried. James wants us to realize that when we are ready to transfer our worldview from what pleases us to what pleases God, from what is capable for us to what God is capable to do through us, from what we want in our lives to what God wants in his world, when we make that transformation, something else happens to us. James says we become mature. And we become complete. Oh, did you hear that? Complete. We're always missing something when we're trying to please ourselves. We're always missing something when we're trying to live for ourselves. We're always missing something when we're dealing with our pains and our hurts. But when we focus on kingdom life and kingdom thinking and kingdom resolutions, we find ourselves whole. When we are tempted and tried, our spirit is transformed. When we are tempted and tried, we no longer need human approval. When we are tempted and tried, we don't fear criticism and we don't fall for compliments. When we are tempted and tried, we're off the roller coaster of circumstances. It doesn't matter what come our way. God will take care of us. When we become tempted and tried, we become steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the love of the Lord. There's something that James didn't say, and I'm going to close by telling you this. Something else happens when we're tempted and tried. We get a new vision of who Jesus is. See, see, it wasn't until I was going through troubled waters that I realized that he's a bridge over troubled waters. It, it wasn't until I was up all night and couldn't figure out which way to go and which way to turn that I realized that he was a mind regulator. It, it, it wasn't until everybody turned their backs on me and 
I couldn't hear nobody pray that I realized that when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. It, it wasn't until I was completely lost and befuddled by which way to go that I realized he's a way maker. It wasn't until I realized that I was a sinner undone that I realized he was a savior. When we are tempted and tried, we see a new Jesus, one who is able to pick us up, turn us around, and plant our feet on solid ground. One who can carry us through the fire and through the flood all because of his blood. Oh, we have to understand today, when we are tempted and tried, we shall come forth. We shall come forth just like, say it for me, pure gold. Give the Lord a praise.